Hello, everyone. Welcome to Calvary International's Wednesday night verse by verse and chapter by chapter Bible study. Let's start with a prayer. So, Heavenly Father, thank you again for tonight that we can get together on YouTube to study your word, to study the Psalms. And um, as you know, tonight we'll be uh, starting a chapter of Psalm 37. Lord, may you just bless this time. Lord, may you just help us to just uh, lay down all our worries and all our troubles, you know, outside. And just this next, you know, 50 minutes, an hour or so, just to rest in you, rest in your word to learn from your word, Lord. So be with each one right now. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're at Psalm 37, and, you know, this is a psalm of David. And and David, you know, he has a, a habit of talking to himself, and sometimes we don't know if he's, if, if he's just, you know, trying to encourage himself or not, but, you know, it's a, it is good for us to study this psalm because I, I learn a lot from it, just studying it. So let's start. It's um, uh, verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. You know, don't worry about, you know, the people who are doing bad things. Do not, um, yeah, do not be be bitter about it. Do not be thinking about it. Um, you know, sometimes we may just be, you know, just in our minds, just, you know, just keep going over what other people are doing. He says, don't do that. Why would you want to do that? Nor be envious of uh, workers of iniquities. It's foolish to be envious of people who are not doing the right thing. And, um, you know, David, he, he sometimes he would have to, again, encourage himself and remind himself that God sees everything. And, you know, it's, um, and then he went on, verse 2, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. You know, the Lord does see everything, and life is short. And sometimes we think life is a long, long time. You know, nothing's going to happen to us. We don't know that. And as um, in Psalm uh, 103, uh, I believe it's 103, and then in Jeremiah 17 also, it talks about the, you know, Life is like the grass. It, it, it flourishes, you know, as the flowers of the field. But the wind passes over it, and next thing you know, it's gone. So we're here for a season of time. And sometimes, you know, and in the end, we do know for sure that we're going to face judgment. We're going to face God. We're going to face the Lord Jesus himself. And we've been talking about this these last few weeks. It's just that there's two lines. One is the judgment seat of Christ for Christians. And then there's the, um, the great white throne judgment for people who do not know Jesus, who never accepted Jesus. And that line's another good line to be in. That line is going to be the line that will show that why they'll be judged and be sent to hell and not heaven. The judgment seat of Christ for the Christians, it's more of a rewards judgment. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go. But for they shall soon be cut down. These are the workers of iniquities like grass and wither as green herbs. Um, David then went on and said, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. You know, trust in the Lord. The the cure to worry is to trust in God, not to trust in ourselves. I mean, everybody says that. You, You need to 
you know, trusting your own heart and all that. Actually, the Word of God tells us not to do that. Uh, we need to trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. God's Word tells us that we need to trust God because He sees the beginning and the end. And He's dwelling the land and feed on His faithfulness. You know, um, when we trust in the Lord, when we, when we commit ourselves to the Lord, we have this, um, this rest that comes to us, this peace that comes to us. But the problem with life, with human beings living in this world, and even with people who go to church, is that we try to generate this, um, this faith of doing things our own way, of wanting things our own way and not doing things God's way, not, not doing things according to God's word. And we try to generate faith and, and generate the spirituality and generate prayers, but no rest. There's no rest in our hearts. There's no rest in our mind. We can't even go to sleep because we're thinking about, oh, we need to do this for the Lord. We need to defend the Lord. We need to... No. You know, actually, with, with trusting, with no, uh, giving our lives to the Lord, I mean, you accepted Christ where you said a prayer to accept Christ. But is there a relationship? Is he first? Jesus, you know, someone asked you, what's the most important thing on earth and, and the most important law? And Jesus said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, do we really believe that? Do we really trust his word? And are we really seeking after him? And are we praying and having that faith that God is in control? And he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. You know, when we start doing things our own way, and we try to, as I said earlier, generate faith, generate this spiritual, just trying to feel good and all that and get all emotional. But then when we're, when we're by ourselves, when we are um, in our own room and everybody's gone, all your friends are, you know, they're at their own home, they're minding their own business, and you still don't have this rest, you still don't have this peace. Um, you know, faith and prayer is not instruments to be used for our own purposes, for our own desires, for what we think is right. Faith and prayer and this trusting in the Lord and doing things His way is for God to align what we're doing to His purpose. When we pray, it's actually not to change God's mind. It is to change our mind. And we're going that way, we're going that way, we're going downwards, but it is to align God's desire, God's purpose for our lives, and He wants us to go this way towards Him, and it's to align John's way, you know, and, and whoever's way, Steve's way, and, 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 and pulling us, you know, just aligning us to His way. And that's trusting in the Lord. That's allowing Him to guide. That's prayer. And that's where we're going to get our rest. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. If you don't have rest to the, today or tonight or for a while, you know, we need to check to see if we're aligned 
with God's way or are we doing it our own way? If we're doing our own way, doing our own thing, there's no rest. There will not be any peace. God wants us to find rest in Him when we trust Him and do good. And He says, delight yourself also in the Lord and He shall give you the desires of your heart. And what that means is that a lot of people use this as a carte blanche to do anything they want. That's not what it says. You know, God actually writes His desires, His laws, into the flesh of our heart. It's not on stone tablets anymore, as in Jeremiah. It's in our heart. He'll give you His desires in your heart, and when we are walking with the Lord, when we're abiding in Him, when we're so close to Him that He can just, by the glance of His eyes, our eyes move the same way as God's eyes. And He, you know, it's a delight to do His will because we're aligned now. Our heart has His desires. And brothers and sisters, friends in YouTube, um, I don't know who you are, but, you know, I, I'm for, you know, the purpose of the YouTube is for the people in the church, but anyone can access it. But let's make sure our what we do, our focus, is on the Lord's desires for our heart. His plans are so good for you, for me, and it's way higher in purpose, and it's above human understanding. But when we delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart, it means that we're going to be doing things that are pleasing to the Lord. And that should be the desire of all of us. You know, sometimes people are wondering, and I have a friend that asked me recently, you know, you're going to be, um, uh, re you know, your age is, you know, in, in, in the U.S., you can retire at any time. And I actually, um, for a while now, I'm kind of retired. It's just uh, I'm serving the Lord in a different capacity as a, as a missionary pastor. Uh, but I'm not working as, you know, at, at my old jobs in, in business and in, um, in, in, other, um, uh, in other things. But, it's, um, but I've been thinking lately about certain things and, you know, I love what I do. I love sharing God's Word. I was just in the Philippines um, a week and a half ago, uh, and, and a friend saw that I was there, and they said, hey, why don't you come over to this over here, and you can teach on Sundays, and, and, and many other places were asking us, and, and I said, you know, um, we're just here for a few days, and we're just going to relax a little bit. But I really enjoy um, just, you know, I delight in doing what God wants me to do. Actually, um, this week, this Sunday, we're, we're having a lot of um, uh, Bible studies and, and just preparing and just um, getting ready, and even for this Bible study, it's uh you know we're gonna we're in First uh, Corinthians um, fourteen fifteen um, for another one and and this is Psalm thirty seven and and I'm teaching through Luke uh, on Sundays it's a uh, it's I was just at, you know I was talking to the Lord about this and I was thinking Lord there's nothing better than this I mean I you know what you can only play golf. And I don't play golf anymore, but you can only play golf for so much, so long, and you can only work out, you can take walks, you can go hiking, but, but this, you know, to do, you know, just to get close to the Lord, to get into His Word, and to share God's Word, God's love, it's, it's delighting yourself in the Lord. You know, your life focus, uh, no matter what 
work you're doing. You could be in business right now. You could be a doctor. My wife just went to be an ophthalmologist, you know, and, and the guy's a Christian. And, you know, you could be in any uh, profession, but your delight, your focus, your primary focus in whatever you do should be in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And then he says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as the noonday. You know, our focus in life is to make sure we're committed to the ways of the Lord. We want to do the things that he asks us to do. Do the things that are in his word. Do the things that are in his heart. We need to trust him. And then his ways are righteousness. His ways are justice. And then, verse 7, the result of that commitment, verse 7, you rest in the Lord. You wait patiently for him. Again, we have rest in the Lord. And we don't have a problem of waiting patiently for Him. Um, sometimes we want everything yesterday. I mean, when I was in business, I wanted everything last week. And there's a lot of pressure with, for everyone. But with the Lord, His timing is always perfect. His timing is right. We can rest in Him and wait patiently patiently for him. And that is if we are delighting ourselves in the Lord, if we are aligned with his purpose and we're not going the opposite way of doing something that he's not pleased with, then there's no rest, there's no peace, and there's no sleep, and there's anxiety. And that's a sign that something is not right. We need to turn around and go toward the Lord. Okay. Um, then, uh, verse, uh, the end of verse 7, because of man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Oh, and um, let me read verse 7 again. Rest in the Lord and wait patient for, for him. Do not fret. Again, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Because of him who prospers in his way, you know, sometimes when, when evil people are doing things and they seem to have all the riches, every, everything seems to be going right for them, and, and they have the big house, the, the nice cars, the drivers, the helpers, and when we don't have any of that stuff, uh, you know, we, we would fret, right? We would think about, you know, how come they're doing so good? And, and Asaph in Psalm 73, we're not... At Psalm 73, yet we're at 37. You know, Shangfan is the other way. We'll get there, you know, probably in a few months. But with that said, um, Asaph, he was, um, he was, oh man, my, um, my iPhone just went down because the stand uh, is not working. But I will not record this one anymore. Sorry about that, guys. That's the first time that happened because we had to put tape on that stand and it doesn't hold anymore. But with that said, um, you know, the, you know, the, we think that people who are, who are doing something wrong and, you know, why are they prospering? But Asaph himself, uh, finally figured it out. He said, until he went into the temple of the Lord, he saw their end. And he saw destruction. And, you know, life on earth is very, very short. And even though you see people prospering for not going, not doing the right thing, you know, in the end, it's a slippery so in Psalm 73, it says, a slippery slope is going to end, and there's going to be judgment, 
And God sees everything. And we need to just wait patiently for Him and rest in Him. And then it says, um, because of man who brings wicked schemes to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Don't get angry. You know, people could be yelling at you. You know, even in church, they could be yelling at you and they could be saying all sorts of crazy things. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. People of God don't do that. We don't go around slandering. We don't go around and just say, hey, come over here for lunch and I'm going to tell you about all the wicked things these guys did. No, don't do stuff like that. God sees. If we truly believe that God's omnipresent, He sees it and He'll take care of it. We pray. He says, do not fret, it only causes harm. Verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For evildoers shall be cut off. That's God's word. So what do we do when we see evil things happen? Well, when I was a cop, um, you know, we stop them, right? You know, anybody who's trying to beat up somebody, we stop them, you know. But life in general, let's just say in work, in, in church, in family, someone wronged you and there could be people who are, you know, they're, they're out to get you. They want you out and all that. What do we do as Christians? You know, we don't just sit around. We use the weapons God gives us. And the weapon is one, is His Word. His Word is, the Bible is, is um, described as a sword. It's an offensive weapon. We use the Word of God. We share the Word of God. And two, we pray. We pray, we, we call out to the Lord, we get brothers and sisters, and we pray. We're not just sitting around doing, and we continue to do ministry. We share God's Word with others. We still serve at, in the church. We have Bible studies. We have prayer meetings. We have outreach programs. We continue to do what God tells us to do. But we use the Word of God um, you know, and a lot of people, they think that they have to um, um, defend God and all that stuff, uh, defend the... No, God, I, I actually think that um, I know for a fact that God can defend him, Himself better than anyone else. He doesn't need any defending from us. We need Him to defend us. And so we should be praying. We should be using His Word the sword of the word, and we should continue to do ministry, to love him, love others. Verse 10, for yet a while, yet a little while, while the, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, and he shall be no more. God will take care of it. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Then there's a bunch of contrasts that David uses. Verse 12, the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. You know, people, when they're plotting something, um, scheming, doing, you know, just whispering, saying, hey, come over here, let me, and doing also, when they have to defend, thinking they're defending God, that's, there's something wrong with that. Um, you're, that's a peculiar uh, position to be in. Um, verse 13, the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy, to slay those who are upright conduct. Their, their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Then verse 16, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many 
wicked. I love this verse. It's, you know, um, it was Paul who wrote, but godliness with contentment is better or is greater than riches. You don't have to have a lot of things. You don't have to have a lot of money. But godliness with contentment is better than riches because a lot of rich people that I know, they're not content. They have probably more money than they can spend in many lifetimes. But they're so worried about what they're going to do. You can't take it with you. Um, as Dr. Dobson said, there's no U-Haul truck following that hearse. But I know, I know a lot of people who have nothing. But they're trusting in the Lord and they're content. And a little that a, that a righteous man has is better than riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord, verse 18, the Lord knows the days of the upright and the inheritance shall be forever. You know, Eternity is a lot longer than temporary earth. So we need to have that uh, perspective that we, there's an eternity. And what we do here on earth will determine where we spend eternity. Verse 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the day, days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the metal, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. Then verse 21. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shall mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Yes. If you're walking with the Lord, God will guide your step. They're ordered by Him. And God will delight in His way. Um, how do we do that? You follow His Word. You abide in Jesus. You know, and His way, you know, his, Thy Word is a lamp unto, me, unto my feet and a, a light unto my path. And, and, um, the Word of God guides us. Um, that's Psalm 119, uh, somewhere. I, let me make sure. I, when, yeah, it's um, Psalm 119, and then it's, uh, um, it says, Your word, I, oh, I was thinking of um, 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. But it's, let me see if I can find it here. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Um, verse 105. Uh, you know, I'm doing this all without uh, notes, but it's good to the Lord's leading. Um, Let's keep going. Uh, verse 18. The Lord knows um, the days of the upright and the inheritance shall be forever. And they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the middle, shall vanish into the smoke. They shall vanish away. And yes, we just went over that. And then we, um, verse 24. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. You know, if our delight is in the Lord, we were walking in his way, he orders our path. Um, even though we may fall at times, the Lord will get him back up if we turn to him. And that happens so many times in life, uh, in my life. When I fall, you know, I, 
we repent right away, we turn back to the Lord right away, He will get us up. It's not this carte blanche stuff where I'm planning to do evil and I'm just going to confess afterwards and, and keep re repeating and repeating and repeating. And that's trying to mock God. But sometimes as we walk in life and sometimes we, we do, we, we, we fall, but we need to get back. We can't be continuing in that path. If we're continuing that path, then I would, you know, I would examine my relationship with Him, with the Lord, to see if it's, was it real or not. Because if I continue that path and I don't want to repent, that's, a, that's an area that we, don't want to, we really want to stay away from. Then, David said, verse 25, I have been young and now am old, and I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. You know, there is an eternal perspective. And we need to make sure that, you know, what we do affects our eternity. The descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Because if we're doing wickedness and not repenting, our children will see that. Our grandchildren, my grandchildren, will see me. Do I really want to influence them and that it will affect their eternity? Or do I want to say, hey, Lord, I repent from my sin. I confess to you my sin. I want to turn away from doing things that's, from doing things that's, not, that's my way, not your way. And, uh, and do I want my children, grandchildren to see that grandpa turn around and walk in God's way? What about you today? Are you doing things that you know is not what the Lord wants? Will you not just turn around and ask the Lord to help you to do that? And then this influences because our family, our spouse, our parents, our children, our grandchildren. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his land, hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall ex exalt you to inherit the land. Wait on the Lord, keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off, and you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he cannot be found. You know, wickedness only goes so far. Again, even if it's a lifetime, it's what, 80, 90, 100 years. He only goes so far. But what David here is saying that he's going to see the people who are after him, they're going to be cut off. He's going to see it. And he may have sought after him, but he's, he can't be found anymore. And, you know, we need to wait patiently and rest in the Lord. All right, I got to get going. I got a couple more chapters to go. Um, and then uh, verse 37, Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, but the future of that man is peace, but the trans transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. What a difference, what a contrast in the eternal destiny. 
One is peace, and one is cut off. The results of our actions will be either peace, or it's going to be cut off from the Lord. Verse 39, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them, and he shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. It pays to live a righteous life. It pays to, to confess to the Lord, to repent from sin, and turn to him. It pays to do that because the future is the Lord's going to deliver them, and the future is peace. But if we don't do that, it's cut off, and the future is not good. And Psalm 38 is, um, is actually a, uh, uh, it was probably, theologians believe that it's probably right before Absalom's revolt, where he went to Hebron and got all those people to follow him and, and, and got rid of, and tried to overthrow, uh, and did for a while, um, his dad. And, um, and David actually, at this time, was feeling some sort of a disease from sin. And, and theologians believe that it's probably STD, sexually transmitted disease, and he was really feeling uh, really, really bad. Um, so we'll go from there. Verse 1 chapter thir- of Psalm 38, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. You know, um, he, he sees the Lord as his heavenly father, and sometimes you know, as a parent, you know, when my kids were young, um, you know, it's better not to get too mad at them or to, to discipline them while you're angry. And somehow, David kind of used what his experience was, humanly speaking, and kind of transferred to God. You know, the Lord, you know, the Lord sees everything. He doesn't make any mistakes. But he's transferring what he his own experience to what the Lord and said, "Hey Lord, you know, don't get mad at me when you're really, really mad. Don't discipline me when you're really, really mad." That's what he's saying. Um, verse two: For your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. So. He, um, he knows he sinned, and he feels the heavy hand of God pressing down. Verse 4, For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering. My wounds are stinking. It just stinks. It smells terrible. STD. Because of my foolishness. There's consequences to foolishness. And that's why it is always good. God's children will know that they did wrong and they would repent, confess as soon as possible. And it's foolish to think that we can do things, have a carte blanche to sin because we think we're you know, chosen and a, whatever. No, God's not going to stand for that. There's consequences to sin. And you can't just go and say, hey, I, I can sin all I want, but uh, because I'm chosen, I'm elected, um, you know, I can do anything I want. That's a bunch of baloney. You know, God sees, and God will judge. He's a God of righteousness, God of just, justice. There's going to be judgment and, and by the way, just because you say a prayer and just because you got baptized doesn't mean, and, and just because you're, you're involved in God's family on earth does not mean that you have eternal security unless you have that personal relationship with God, unless you have that heart of just abiding in God. And Jesus said, 
you'll know them by their fruit. So being part of God's family on Sundays in coming doesn't mean that you have eternal security. And if you think nothing in the Bible says that. But Jesus again said, you'll know them by their fruit. Abide in me and I, I in you. And, and if you are not doing what Jesus says in his word, um, th if there's no natural fruit, and if you're trying to make up fruit, plastic fruit tastes terrible. So um, David, he repented. He knew he did wrong. And he says, it's because of my foolishness that all these things are stinking up. My wounds are foul and festering. It stinks. It's terrible. Uh, it hurts. You know, God's, it's too heavy for me. The pressing in is too heavy for me. But he's asking God for help. He understood. And that's why, um, you know, in Psalm 51, he asked the Lord to create in him a clean heart. Verse 6, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all day long, for my loins are full of inflammation, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and severely broken, I groan because of the toil of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. David was going, ah, oh. I mean, he was just sighing everywhere he goes. He has... He, it's believed that he had STD, and it, it's no fun. He's telling us it's no fun, and this this it, it stinks, and everybody knows it. And he's asking the Lord for help. And then he says, "My heart pants, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes it also has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof." From my plague, and my relatives stand afar off. Nobody wants to be with him. Remember, this was probably prior to Absalom taking taking over, and he's feeling the pressure. No one wants to be with him, and especially when he's sick like that. My um, and his relatives don't want to be with him. Verse twelve: uh, Those who also seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speaks of destruction and plan deception all the day long. People are, I mean, he can't trust anyone. And they're planning there, trying to take over there, which position, oh, I can come into this place and, you know, all mine, all mine. It's all, and plan deception all day long. Verse 13, but I, like a deaf man, do not hear, for I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. For I am like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth is no response. For you, you, O Lord, I hope. So David trusted the Lord. He didn't say anything. He just kept quiet. He trusted the Lord. You will, but he cried out to the Lord. You will hear, O Lord my God. For I said, verse 16, hear me, lest they rejoice over me lest my, when my foot slips, they exalt themselves against me. Verse 17, for I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. And I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. He, know, he, know, he knew that he is a sinner. And he, he confessed it. Verse 19, but my enemies are vigorous and they are strong. For those who hate me wrongfully have multi multiplied. So, you know, the wicked people, they were trying to get people there. And Absalom at this time went to Hebron and he was telling people how, you know, he's helping kings no good and, and getting all his people ready. And that's how he, and a lot of people thought, oh, this young guy is going to get rid of the old guy. And they join. And so David's saying, and those who hate me wrongfully have multiplied. Verse 20, they also who render evil for good, they are my adversaries because I follow what is good. Verse 21, 
Then he prayed again, Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So this was kind of a penitent um, psalm that David wrote. And if you think about it, we pray this prayer too. Make haste. Lord, can you hurry up and help me? I'm sure you pray this prayer. I pray this prayer. O oh Lord, my salvation. Then we'll finish up um, Psalm 39. I said, I will guard my way lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. You know, the tongue is small, but it has, uh, it can cause great sin. And David here is saying, I need to tame my tongue. I need to uh, to guard my tongue. Verse 2, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. You know, when you don't, even if you don't say anything, sometimes in your heart, it gets, you know, you get angry inside, right? And David was confessing that. He was saying that. He said, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was, sorrow was stirred up. Then he said, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. You know, sometimes, you know, we try to hold it, hold it, hold it. The only way we can abide in Christ is if we spend time in His Word and ask the Lord to help us. You can only be so nice. I can only be so nice for five minutes. I mean, it's just a short time. We can go, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be nice. I don't want to say anything. You can, and it's gonna, your heart's going to burn and everything inside is stirred up. You're going to get really hot and boom, it comes right out in that moment. I've seen it with husband and wives. I've seen it with father and child. And I've seen it with grandparents. It's just going to blow. We can only hold it for so long. But only with God's help, only with the Holy Spirit inside us that we allow. And by the way, God will never force you to do anything. Only when we abide in Him, only when we open up our heart and our mind saying, Lord, if I'm wrong, change me. Change me. And Though only if we're willing to do that, then, you know, the Lord will help us to have that rest, help us to have that peace. But if we're struggling against the Lord, and that's not a good position to be in, if we're saying that we have to defend you, God, that's not a good position to be in. Okay, and then... um. Verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? You know, we need to ask God to give us His perspective. We need to ask God to see what the eternal perspective of our actions are. And not man's perspective. Oh, I, I, I'm just going to do this for the next few years, and, and I'm going to defend the Lord. I'm going to... No. As I said earlier, you know, for me to, to learn from the Word of God and to be able to, 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 to share um, the Word of God with others, there's nothing better. And for you, if you're a doctor, to just reflect God's love, there's nothing better. You know, we can't, uh, we need to have that really, the focus should always be what the Lord wants us to do. Make me know my end, because our end here is close. As I said, my dad left when he was 65. I only have three and a half years to, before I reach that. And then he's in heaven. He's enjoying his bright eternity. But we only have so much time here on earth from heaven's perspective. And for me, anything after 65, and I have friends who just left in their 50s. 
but you know, since my dad, uh, you know, he left at 65, you know, life is short. My first wife left at 50. Life is short. It's, um, that's why I, I, I was talking to, to Susan this morning that, you know, nothing really matters in life except for what we do for the Lord. There's only one life we have here on earth, and only what we do for God counts in, the, in eternity. Nothing else matters. And I, you know, because I, I have family members that passed, and, and they're very close to me, and nothing else really matters except for what's important to the Lord. Um, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand's breadth, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at best is but vapor. You know, age, what age you are, you know, God knows. God knows the end. And David here is saying, even in his best state, I'm way past my best state. At, you know, I'm 61 uh, this coming month, and I'm way past it because my, my trainer tells me that you're way past it. But anyway, um, even in my best state, probably best health, you know, teenage years when I was playing ball and all that. But with that said, um, even in the best state, it's vapor. It's nothing. I mean, that's saying something. Verse 6, Surely every man walks about it like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. You know, a lot of people who are very, very wealthy, and it's really hard to reach them because they're not in need. And uh, it, Jesus is the one who said that uh, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. It's because they don't have any wants. But they can heap up riches and does not know who will gather them, they're going to leave it here. You can't have that. As, as, as I said earlier, Dr. Dobson said it a long time ago, there's no U-Haul following the hearse. You can't take it with you. They don't even know who's going to be spending it and if they're going to do anything good with it. Verse 7, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Our focus, our hope, our life is in the Lord, is in the Lord God, and for us, it's Lord Jesus Christ. He's our advocate. He's the one who died for us on the cross, and we're going to go see him. He's going to come back again. Either he comes back first, or we go see him first. Either way, Christians win. Deliver me from all my transgressions, verse 8, and do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by your bow, blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like moth. Surely every man is vapor. You know, we're only beautiful for a short time. Uh, that's why all these um, cosmetic um, companies make a lot of money. We try to cover it up. Surely every man is vapor. Life will end. Then verse 12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. We are travelers here on earth. We're just visiting earth. Our citizenship, if you're a Christian, is in heaven. If you truly know Jesus Christ, if you abide in him and walk with him, you have natural fruit of the Spirit. And you have accepted Him 
through faith in Him by His grace. And it's only by the grace of God that we're saved. But if you truly trust Him and walk with Him, we're sojourners, travelers, visitors, temporarily just tent dwellers here on earth because our real world is in heaven with Jesus. And then last verse, remove your gaze from me that I may regain strength before I go and, I, and am no more. David knew his future. Future was not here on earth. It's going to be with the Lord. And that's your future, my future, if you and I both know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Why not make sure? Ask him to come into your heart. Give your life to him. <coughs> truly, <coughs> sorry, well, I need some water. Truly trust him. You know, my, um, my life is in God's hand. My health is in God's hand. And he knows your situation. He knows my situation. But there's going to be a time where you're going to have to sit down and really evaluate your life. Do you want to walk with the Lord? Do you want to rest in him? And actually, that peace of God, that rest of God, it starts today if you're willing to truly walk with the Lord. Um, trust Him. Really trust Him. I do. I, I tr don't do anything um, now that, that um, and I try not to worry too much about things, but I trust the Lord. I believe He has um, the best plan. And then I always ask the Lord, if there's any wicked things in me, please take it away. I want to confess right away and turn to you. Will you also do that with me as we walk with him daily as he guides us through? He's holding our hands. He's our great shepherd, our Lord Jesus. Trust him. In Je Let's pray. Uh, Lord, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for just being our guide, for your word, that we can trust you that you have our very lives in your hand. And Lord, it doesn't matter who we are or what we do. We need to trust you. We need to ask you to continue to just guide our lives. We shouldn't be trusting man, but we need to trust your word and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. So thank you, Lord, for all you've been doing. And I pray for each one listening right now. Will you let them know that you love them? That they should, they can come to you anytime. And if they do not know you yet, they can accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if they do know you, but they're going the wrong way, I pray you just draw them back to you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me. God bless you. See you here next Wednesday.